Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Right, good Merci evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here, and I'm absolutely delighted to, to have you here and uh, here at the Centre Pompidou with this uh, culture and creation department, and I'm very honored to be head of that department. So this is part of a festival called Orpiste, and each year it is trying to explore all kinds of uh, moving images from video to cinema, from installations to um, TV series, and uh, amateur images and we try and be curious about these kind of images from people who do it. So, of course, it is a festival dedicated to several kinds of images. And so after seven tonight, uh, we will have David Dufresne uh, being uh, here in uh, his lesson on images, and uh, it will be... Uh, uh, in the, at, in the basement. And tomorrow we'll have Bar Bertrand Bonello, Barbette Schroeder, Marie Richer, who's a writer and novelist, Alice Diop, who's a novelist, Alain Damasio, and uh, so many other uh, talented writers till uh, the 18th of February. Um, as I'm uh, naming names, I want to continue and saying congratulating uh, our interviewers. Sylvie Laurent, she's an Americanist, American historian uh, and she's uh, dedicating on uh, studying uh, races in, in America, and Emmanuel Burdeau, who's a, a participant to Mediapart and has written a, a book on the wire. So this is for our interviewers tonight, and I hope that uh, they uh, don't limit themselves to repeat uh, fuck as it happens in one of the episodes in the wire. Of course, I want to name uh, uh, our interpreters, if Tixi and Caroline Ferrar. And I also want to name other names, people who are not with us today, but uh, you might have uh, had an experience with uh, a few uh, moments ago. Bodhi, for example, is my case. Uh, Candy, Bubble, Darling, Loretta, Wallace. Paul Wallace, Snoop, Snoop. Uh, Snoop's killer, Nick Vasisto, Penny Covian, Albert, Big Chief Lambrou, and Snot in particular. And I'm thinking of him because he's the first person who died in the first scene, first episode, first season of The Wire. And this is the life of whom we, uh, we tell in The Wire. He's already dead when, when, dead when it starts, and he's sitting on uh, the footsteps, and he's saying how he's lived his life. And the scene uh, ends it ends with that's America. So this is what our uh, guest tonight has done so far, is uh, giving names to uh, characters to make their uh, life uh, alive and saying contemporary America's history and also to uh, say how stories are told. So I wanted, uh, I, I want to say the, the, the way it's always uh, been done. Please welcome. From David Simon. Hi. Well, it's not impressive at all. Great. I just want to say a few words as an introduction. First, to first to say that um, we are delighted and honored to be here talking to David Simon. It's a, can you hear me? Can you hear me, David? And I also want to try in a few sentences to to try to express what is the singular, unique um, position of David Simon in contemporary TV. 
And, and that uniqueness uh, comes from one specific feature, which is the fact that in that third golden age of television that started at, in the early 2000s is, in my opinion, the only true author, as in author in, in the, the old-fashioned sense. And being the only author, he's maybe the only um, creator of a series or showrunner to conceive his work without looking towards cinema at all. And he's an exception. The fact that he doesn't look towards cinema is, is an exception. Um, he, has, he's, he has created a huge number of series, The Wire, that uh, Mathieu was just um, talking about, The Corner, and we'll see a, a short clip from The Corner right now, Tremi, Jerish and Kill, Show Me a Hero, The Deuce. And in six weeks, the adaptation of um, Philip Roth's novel, The Plot Against America. So all these series bear the mark of David Simon, but um, to my knowledge, he has so far direct, he hasn't directed one single episode of series, or maybe one or two, I'm not sure, but, but all other showrunners want to direct maybe the first episode of a season or the last episode of the season to occupy the position that to them is the most prestigious, that of director. David Simon's work is doesn't see television as the start or, or, or a first step towards cinema, but television is has a, a different relationship to, or he has a different relationship to TV. Um, there's, a, there's a link to journalism that he comes from, literature, um, and, and, and it's, it's not, not by chance that he's adapting uh, an amazing um, novel like this. Um, he's also, there's a strong link to social science. I'm sure that there will be David Simon universities in America, maybe in a few decades or in a few years. Um, and, and maybe uh, Mathieu Bod, uh, Paul Bonneville will be teaching Snoop theory in a French university. Um, so th this is something that's very specific, very unique within TV, within um, TV fiction, but having a relationship um, with, with truth, having a relation with truth that is based on um, um, on belief, on faith, um, that is based on um, on proximity with, with truth. And Matthew said it, David is portraying America over and over again. And, and according to David Simon, if there is a privilege for um, TV series, it is not only to provide entertainment, or, 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 but to say true things or to, or, or to try to inscribe dur durable truth on, on TV. So it's a great privilege to be here. Uh, it's a privilege that we can talk with, with David Simon today. Sylvie si Laurent is with me um, tonight or this afternoon. We won't be Bunk and McNulty, even though I'd love to. Uh, Sylvie is a uh, specialist in um, American history, recent American history. I'm a, I'm a cinema um, critic, so we'll be um, we'll have two different positions in that dialogue. And before we watch a first clip that we wanted to start with, um, it, I just wanted to tell you that we are the, the 20 years ago the wire started. Uh, sorry, 20 years ago the corner started, and, um, and it's a series that maybe has been understated, under, underestimated because it's only seen as a premise to, to The Wire. But time is very important for David Simon. Duration is very important. There are things that only a length of time, only the duration can bring. And if you've seen uh, the third season of The Deuce, you can measure that because that third season is a re-reading of um, a reassessment of the first two seasons. So because time is so important to David Simon, I'd like to ask him a very simple question. What does... What do you? What, what does it feel to hear today about the corner? What memories do you have of the corner? It was not your beginning in TV, 
but it was the start of something that he did under his own name. Is it a series that to him is only a starting point? Is it uh, a series that is in the continuity of what he has done afterwards? Um, and after David's reply, we can watch a clip from um, the from um, the corner. Um, okay. Uh, well, I, to begin with, in I would say the thing that makes me unique in television is probably, uh, I'm more inclined to suggest that it's the fact that I've managed to live there for 20 years and actually not have an audience. So, um, no, you know, unlike a lot of American television makers, nobody actually watches the shows when they're on the air. So um, it's, a, it's a fairly unique sinecure for me to have in, uh, in American television. Um, but um, with regard to the corner, I was coming off of having sold the first book that I wrote of journalism homicide to NBC, and when it came to film in my town, I learned to I learned some of television to the point where I had a a, a notion that maybe I could make the second one into a miniseries, only to sell more books. I was going to go back to my newspaper and be a journalist for um, for uh, for the dur duration. Uh, and so, when I managed to make it, um, and I thought, well, now I'm gonna gonna leave. And I, you know, I, I learned I learned just enough television to tell that story, which I understood implicitly, having reported it. And then HBO, having done well with this very small miniseries, said to me, "What else have you got?" And uh, I thought to myself, well. We couldn't really do policy about why, where the drug war went wrong and you know, sort of the nature of poverty and, and drug prohibition. We, there, were, there were themes that we could not address in great detail because the corner was really about the, the microcosm of a, of, a, of, a, of a single family, a single broken family in a drug-saturated part of America in a very poor section of my city. So maybe we could do something a little more fictional, but, but address ourselves to the critique of these policies. And so I came back with The Wire, and I th even then I thought, well, this is interesting, and I'll, I'll do this for a while, but eventually I'm definitely going back to a newspaper. Uh, it's honest, honest truth. And I had a, a standing offer from The Washington Post, a, a better newspaper than my own. And then after The Wire, uh, they handed me Generation Kill, uh, guy from HBO said, we, we just optioned this, what do you think? And I read it, and it was another journalist's take on young men in war, and I thought, wow, somebody should make this. And somewhere around the middle of Generation Kill, when I was filming in um, Mozambique, of all places, I had to admit that maybe I wasn't going back to a newspaper. <laughs> uh, and it was only at that point, years, you know, I, I, I was dragged kicking and screaming into television. So when you show me the corner, I just think that's the end of a perfectly viable newspaper career right there. <laughs> I, I just didn't know it. So we'll, we'll start with the end of that career as a journalist then. We'll, we'll, we'll be showing four or five clips today and we made sure that they can be understood by people who have not seen the series or, or who have not the series in, in, in mind. So the, the end of the first episode of The Corner with that clip, I think. To, to give a little bit of context to that um, clip, Gary, who's one of the characters in the corner, is a drug addict, and like most of the like most of the people in that series, he's a crack addict. Um, that was a plague for American ghettos um, for decades in the states. And in that scene, he remembers when going back into his parents' cellar. He he revises his uh, chemistry lessons, but he's uh, deeply addicted, and he's just about to to take some more crack. So the story of um, the character of Gary is a story of someone who, like all other characters, try to try to fight against his addiction. 
but his addiction um, wins eventually because the call of the crack is too strong. And what I found was crucial and at the, at the heart of um, David Simon's work is that you understood that while he's on his bed, reading his uh, chemistry book and um, just about to to take some crack, is listening to the radio. The radio is on. And in the background, you hear um, um, a, a radio program where people are calling uh, the radio and is providing the usual discourse that one hears about poverty in the States, the classical neoliberal discourse. Why are these people complaining? They are taking drugs. No, no one st forced them to take drugs. They, they need to, um, those who work hard can, can succeed. So that, that ideology of the, um, of the meritocracy of the individual who should be able to get out of their environment to succeed. And it's a discourse that's applied, especially to poor people in the States, especially when they are Hispano or Blacks. And it's a discourse that is very present in terms of uh, the drug addictions in um, in the inner cities. I don't know if you remember, but in the 80s, there was a campaign by the Reagan administration against drugs. Um, and the slogan of that Reagan campaign was, just say no. And what that person says on the radio, that call on the radio, is that blacks are very nice, but they really need to um, to pull their stocks up, and if they did a little bit, if they tried, they would manage, they would succeed. And and, and, and the voice is very similar to David. The voice of that caller is very similar to David. So I don't know, I was wondering if it was David who played that, that, um, and that caller. But it is the discourse of neoliberalism in the States. And, and that neoliberal cliche on, um, on individual responsibility is the dominating discourse. And if that, um, in, if, if that uh, meeting today, that uh, conversation is called a counter history or a counter discourse, is, that, is because I feel that David Simon's work is to provide a counter discourse uh, to neoliberalism. Um, the, to the fact that an individual should always be able to get out of their, of their background, of their context. The fact that you should, have, you should follow positive psychology, if you follow the rules and work hard, if you have work ethics, you'll succeed. And to that neoliberal ideology, which leads to putting forward the figure of the hero, the individual against the system, the, um, the, 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 the Avenger or the, the person providing justice, um, which, is a, which is the figure that crosses the whole of, um, of American cinema especially, and maybe that's why David is not interested in cinema. I think that David's, David Simon's work is showing the power of structures of the collective, that oppression is a political economy, and that the network of oppression is so strong that there is no individual the mayor, uh, a gangster, uh, a president of the United States, anyone who can go against that collective force. And the counter discourse that David is proposing is a counter ideology that is stopping, that is, that is saying that poor are not necessarily responsible because they are poor. It's not necessarily their fault. They just, it's not the fact that you have to say no, as Reagan said. Um, and, and David says that society is not um, a, a set of individuals. Margaret Thatcher used to say that society was there was no societies, there was only individuals. No, there is oppression, oppression that can be inherited. There is collective oppression. Um, and a lot of people have said that, um, on, on the other hand, that there's, no, there's never any talk about racism in David Simon's work. And it makes me smile because I feel that it's all about racism, but it's never said. Um, the corner, the wire, is a denunciation of the war against drugs that's being led in the inner cities in the States. There's, there is another, uh, there's another epidemic, there's another epidemics in the States for white America, the, the, the fact that there's a lot of people addicted to, um, to um, opiates. Um, and, and ideology, and the discourse there is not because it's white people who are uh, addicts, 
the discourse is um, they need to be cured, they need to be centers for people who are being uh, addicted to the opiates. So we, what we have there is the criminalization of addiction. Um, so there's a cr criminalization of addiction for the blacks and, and there's an understanding for the whites. So there is something that is close to what Don Quixote does when David Simon fights that ideology. So my question to him is, does he think, because he's so interested in structures, in political economy, in institutions, does he think that ideology, ideologies can be changed? And on the question of the, the power between the war on drugs in Baltimore, the great black cities, and the way the crisis of the op opiates is being dealt with in, in the so-called white areas, does he feel that there is a difference in, in the way they are being um, dealt with? Since he has um, since he has finished his work on the wire or, or the corner, um, something that probably suffuses all of the narratives that I've been able to do for television is the, is the um, I think a blunt economic assessment that um, in this um, almost a. a um, overweening moment of capitalism. Uh, human beings, all of us, as a, as a cohort, as a human cohort, I'm not talking about individuals. Uh, I'm doing fine. I work for American television. I got a good gig. But generally speaking, humans are worth less. Um, labor has been devalued. We don't need as many human beings to operate our world as we once did. And that's never going to change going forward. Um, automation is a certitude. And labor will never be what it, uh, what it, what it was in terms of human value. The, human val the, the, the value of human labor being um, as elemental as, as it was in the 20th century or the 19th or the 18th. Um, so in all of the universes that we're depicting, um, people are struggling for existential meaning. White, black, uh, the sex workers in the deuce, the Marines in Generation Kill, um, the people on the corner, um, the, the, the people in public housing in, in Show Me Hero. It's all, there's a presumption that people are worth less with every passing day. And we're not really, you know, our system's not really addressing ourselves to this fundamental reality. Capital has max, you know, when allowed to maximize profit, if, if your metric is only profit, if that's how you judge the viability of your society by maximized profit, then labor is a cost. And I come from a country where since 1980, the idea of the market will determine what uh, has value and what's just and what's fair. The market, the, the price per share, will determine. Uh, that's been the operant political philosophy of my country now for 40 years. And so we're reaping the whirlwind. So if you're asking me if I have hope, I do not. Um, if you're asking me if that absolves any of us of the argument or of the fight, I would say it does not. Um, you guys in France have a, a, a notable writer who somebody handed me the book, at, uh, the, uh, the Myth of Sisyphus, or the, or the article, or the essay, uh, Camus. And in it, he basically makes the argument that I think every journalist holds dear, which is that, you know, as I, when I was a newspaper man, I knew if I wrote a good story, you could bring it to the campfire, and you could say, um, this is a good story. This is, there's some truth in this. This is, you haven't heard this one before. And you, in, in the back of your mind, you might tell yourself, when they get a load of, of my shit, when they, when they get a load of how good this story is, they'll, they'll fix it. They'll pass a law, they'll, 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 they'll intervene. They'll, the, nobody's gonna let this go on. I just, I just showed you where the world's turning to shit for somebody. Go fix it. And they never come and fix it. Sometimes they pass a law, sometimes the law makes it worse. Sometimes somebody holds up your article and comes to the exact wrong conclusion. 
The mayor of Baltimore held up the corner, which was an argument against the drug war, at the corner where we reported it and said, I'm going to take back these drug corners. I'm going to arrest everybody. So, and he got elected. So I helped. You know, and what I've come to realize as a storyteller is that I'm responsible for the story. And I want to get to the, the story out there so that nobody can say, people living the event, if you, were, if you spent time on a drug corner, if you came through addiction, if you're a, a police officer who knows his job, if you're a, a, a recon marine who you know, was invading Iraq, if you're, uh, if you're living in public housing in Yonkers, you won't watch it and say, well, that's bullshit, or that's not true. That's not my life. That's not my job. That's not my world. I, I want to not embarrass myself in front of them. And that's it. That's like ambition enough. I don't have faith that the modern world structured as it is with all of capital arrayed against reform. I mean, in my country, they've purchased the government now. They've purchased the national legislature. Um, so I don't have any, and it doesn't absolve me of, not, of, have, of, not, of having a lesser argument or of diving into entertaining you while, while we all go down in flames. The, the part of me that was a journalist um, can't abide that. I can't be, I can't be in the, I'm in the entertainment industry. It's a fucking tragedy. Um, so if I'm here and if they're, as long as they let me stay, I have to throw a tantrum. I have to argue what I think is important, but I don't do it with any sense that um, the game isn't rigged. I think the game has now been pretty well rigged. And um, again, you know, what, what Camus was effectively saying in that essay, which really struck a chord in me, was, you know, to fight against almost Im against improbable odds is absurd. It's absolutely absurd. To not fight against improbable odds, it's also absurd. And it lacks dignity. So yeah, those are your choices. You know, you might as well cling to dignity. Merci. Je voudrais... Vous m'entendez? Oui. Je voudrais... I'd, I'd like to go back uh, just a little bit. You, you mentioned the corner not being as the beginning, the, not, not only as the, the end of a career in television, but also the end of your career in journalism. And you said that your situation, your personal situation is, is, is better than the situation of the average citizen in the States. But I'd like to tell us, I'd like you to, and, and you said, uh, smiling, that your exp one of your exploits was working in TV for 20 years without having, any, uh, having an audience, but being, being a part of a structure, which is the structure of entertainment, to what types of resistance are you faced? Are they the same resistances? Uh, than 10 or 12 years ago, the, the enormous, is it true that the recognition of the wire hasn't changed anything for you? You mentioned Camus, the, the myth of Sisyphus, and, and, and the last sentence of, I think, of the, the book is, one has to imagine Sisyphus happy. Are you happy in TV? Are you Sisyphus in TV? Uh, I'm generally happy. I have a, res a reputation as being a misanthrope um, because of the way I argue. But I like to see the game on Sunday, and you know, my kids are my kids, and you know, I, I have a lot of fun. It's you know, I, I, there is the rhetorical David Simon, who um, is very profane and blunt. And there's the um, the guy on the sofa on the on the couch, and he's okay. He's doing okay. Um, it has gotten the wire made it easier to sell certain things to to my sponsor HBO, and, and HBO in the pantheon of American television compared to most networks, they're like the Medici's um, for me. Um, as long as there were big tentpole shows that were floating the network, like The Sopranos or Game of Thrones, they would let me do my little cute things. And, and if I did them in cities where the, um, the network execs couldn't actually, would never want to go there, 
like Baltimore or Yonkers, uh, then, then um, I didn't even have to worry about them showing up on set. They would just, as long as we stayed under budget, they, you know, go make your little very, relatively cheap show. And, you know, um, and as long, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have viewers, still not to this day. I mean, we, nobody watches the shows when they're on the air. They watch them years later by word of mouth, if they watch them at all. And then, um, and I didn't win Emmys, because all of our stuff was East Coast, all of our crew base was East Coast. And if you watch the shows, you have to watch all of them. Like, you can't send up episode 302 and go, this is a really good one, you know? So, no prizes. And those are the two metrics that generally matter to HBO. The one that kept me alive was, every now and then I would fight my way off the entertainment pages onto the, to the editorial pages of, it would become an argument among uh, elites. The shows were, somebody said very, very cleverly in a review, the shows are watched by people in the inner city, people with, I mean, The Wire was a huge hit among among people who were familiar with the, that world because they lived in that world and endured that world, and with academics and, 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 and uh, you know, sort of social scientists, with the middle hollowed out. Nobody in the middle watched. Um, but in some respects, uh, that allowed it to get off the entertainment pages and be argued as policy. Like, oh, wait, wait, this is, we're gonna argue about this like it's important. And that had a weird value to HBO. I was like the public broadcasting part of HBO. They were like, not, not, okay, he doesn't bring us viewers and he doesn't bring us prizes, but they argue about him in the New York Times. So we'll give him, keep him on, the, he's part of our brand. And I rode that horse as hard as I could for 20 years now. It's been, you know, it's been quite a ride. But that's, they've let me do it and I'm very grateful. Because I'm, again, I'm, I'm existing in a, in a, in a industry that does not usually value that. Right, just to continue on this, uh, at the beginning of season two uh, in The Wire, there's a particular moment when McNulty uh, finds dead bodies in a container and one in particular is floating. And so he's trying, uh, well, he's, he's doing a little manipulation and in fact, he's sending faxes to a uh, police headquarters, I can't remember where, but I think I read somewhere that you were that person, the person who, because you wanted to get what you wanted from HBO, you could send memos and memos and memos again, and just to be, you know, just to get what you wanted. Some of my early memos to HBO uh, to try to turn the ship around it, when, you know, what the show would be, or please make this show. Uh, or don't do this, or don't, um, you know, don't ask us to do that. They were grandly hyperbolic and calculated and full of bile, but also playful. So like, there was like, it, it, some of them were funny at points, but it was a performance. It was sales. I was selling. And... It worked for a time, you know, after two, three years, the execs I was, were writing to, they started to get hip to it. They started to get aware that, oh, he's just going on. Like, it has diminishing efficacy. Uh, you can only throw a tantrum so many times before they, they look at you and go, get up off the floor. You know, so, yeah, in, in the beginning, I was trying to carve out a certain level of independence, but also, um, let me do this long enough so that you'll see what it becomes. And yeah, when the shows, some, when some of the early seasons of the show were, uh, were finished, they would say, um, okay, we trust you a little more now. But in the beginning, you know, I remember uh, Chris Albrecht said, uh, after watching five episodes of The Wire, he said, I've watched five now, it's getting better. You know, and I thought, he says, you know, number five is, is way better than number one, which is, you know, and, and better than number two. And, and I thought to myself, they're all where, it's chapter one, chapter two, it's, it's all the same book. But okay, yeah, it's getting better. 
money, bring money, you know, so. Right, so let's um, look at the second clip, which is another a, a clip from another series, mini-series, and uh, we'll do a leap in time in 15 years, so we're going to have a look at Show Me a Hero, and I think if I remember well, it's out in 2015, and I think it's season two. Well, I mean, let's have a look and, and we'll talk about it. And we'll talk about it afterwards. I, I couldn't give you the detail, but I think it's it's quite straightforward. It's, it's quite clear. Well, you know, I'll, I'll like to say a few words for uh, about what we're gonna what we're about to watch. It's uh, show me here is about Yonkers in New York, and it's the judge's decision. So the uh, newly elected mayor has to. Uh, have the um, population accept that there would be uh, public housing in uh, in the city and not in one part in particular, but uh, everywhere. And so just in particular to avoid this, uh, these projects being, uh, um, this public housing being built in one part only. And so the judge is trying to uh, have these public housing built everywhere. And so the mayor is trying to have his administration uh, accept these public housing be built in white uh, areas. And so this is something we're quite familiar with in Paris as well. So this, what we're about to see now is a uh, a council of the administration and the reactions from um, different kinds of people and see how people are reacting to the announcement of uh, public housing being uh, are going to be built. Yeah, exactly what I wanted to say. Right, let's, uh, let's have a look at the clip. Thank you. You get all that? In fact, I think we had... Right, sorry, we had a um, little problem with the time codes, but anyway, apparently it's not easy to work for television. Right, so I have a question anyway. Uh, let's improvise. What's remarkable and, and what I'm mostly interested in, show me hero, is that the mayor is now uh, ad focusing a project that he first opposed, and that's his tragedy. And so uh, can, can you elaborate on that? Can you um, say a few words about that? Because he's then uh, defending, well, being a hero, which is in the title, which is a, a hero, anti-hero uh, theme. And something more uh, local is you see how uh, the different speeches uh, are cut and, and said, and so it's Oscar Isaac and then uh, his opponent. And so the, the, the editing is very quick, the pace is very quick. And so, of course, it is uh, reinforcing that opposition. Of course, you you said, um, or I said earlier, that you didn't want to be a film uh, no, director, but it doesn't mean that you're not part of the set uh, when it's being filmed. And what do you think about it and how the way it is uh, edited, is it something that you had imagined right uh, when you were writing it or when you uh, were doing the editing? And do, do, are you part of the editing uh, for all of your series? Yeah, last cut is mine. Um, I am part of the editing, last cut is mine. Um, it, the answer to the, the technical question is, if you want to protect the writing, you got to go to set, you got to stand behind the director. I don't know shot. I mean, I could shoot something in a very um, workmanlike way. Uh, wide, uh, two shot, two shot, over, over, bang. Uh, the, the, what, when the camera is creative, when the camera is delicate, when it has nuance, that's a director, that's somebody who went to film school. Um, what I do know is when the, the camera's gone, is not covering, is not conveying what I need out of the scene. I can see that when it's happening. And I can tap the director and say, I don't have what I need. Yeah, I, I need to see this. And so I can I can be um, uh, I can be prescriptive. I can't be diagnostic, to use medical terms. Can you sometimes ask for things to be re re shot? 
I don't like I don't like to I don't have those kinds of budgets. I don't like to pay for the same real estate twice. So I go to set and I watch. Or if I'm working with another writer, who, a writer producer I trust, George Palkanis goes to set, or or Nina, or you know somebody who I trust. And there's always somebody at the village behind the monitor going, "Yeah, we got it." We got it, or you know, adjust the performance, or adjust the shot, or you know, I need an insert shot of this, or I can't tell the story. Um, and I've gotten better at it. I mean, I've had now uh, 30 years, including homicide, of playing around. In the beginning, I didn't know, you know, I knew nothing. Um, they sent me to set. I was one minute I was a newspaperman, the next moment I'm standing on set like I have a clue, but. There came a moment where, uh, and not to, not to bore anybody with this, but I'll never forget it, which is I started explaining why without a certain insert shot, without it being motivated from a look, and I, it's, you're giving, the camera knows too much. The camera's telling a story it shouldn't be able to know. You haven't given the camera enough information for it to go to that place. The camera's being too smart. It's, it's being omniscient. It's not telling the story right. And I used language that was my language of like storytelling. And the director, uh, it was Ed Bianchi, who was trying to sell that shot, he finally started laughing. And I said, what, am I funny? And he, he, I'm trying to make sense here. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, you just, without actually, um, without trying, because you, you, but you know, you're trying, I mean, without having the language, you just explained the motivations of camera from the Truffaut Hitchcock interviews. You just did that without any film for vocabulary at all. You basically said what, where the camera had to go. And so I went right out and I read that stuff for the first time and I went, oh, so you guys knew this already. Like, <laughs> I, I learned it on the, you know, by the seat of my pants, uh, but, I, but I did try to learn it. Um, so. I try to fix it there, and then, yes, then afterwards you have all the film and, and you do other stuff in editing. What, 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 what is, and also, you know, editing is, editing is a matter of pace and a matter of, you know, so you learn that. But it's been trial and error, and, um, and I had people t trying to teach me, so I had that. Um, and now you've got to help me with the first part. I, I tried to help you with the second part. Of the Merci. Uh, la pro ma première question concernait le... Yes, sorry, so the first part of my question is the, 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 the hero from Show Me Your Hero and the fact that he's now focusing for a project that was not his at the beginning. The conceit of that, the conceit of Show Me a Hero is in the quote. Uh, the quote is from F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, Show me a hero and I'll write you a tragedy. Um, the main character, played by Oscar Isaac, in, in the film is, a, is the youngest mayor in America who is elected on the rhetoric, the populist rhetoric of, I will stop them from building a, a low-income housing project on, on the white side of town. So he, he mobilizes the, the, the largest voting block in Yonkers to elect him over the existing four-term mayor who finally had conceded that they had no legal basis to stop the federal judge from ordering this because they had spent all the federal housing money purposefully and openly to hyper-segregate Yonkers. They had spent the money to make sure that black folk only lived in a very small portion of the city and everything else stayed white. And they'd done it openly, like the, the whole, all the history of their meetings they acknowledged it. It was like, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Well, you can't do that with federal money. So he was going to lose. Anyway, the, the, the existing mayor doesn't pretend to be a populist. He says, this is what we got to do. And the kid beats him because he appeals to the most base part of our fears. Does anyone want to think about a politician in today's environment using fear of the other, um, fear of the, the outsider, fear of change, and a, and a validation of um, racial or nationalistic 
um, homogeny in order to wield power. It's the same story over and over again. The, the Achilles heel of, of all the Western democracies is the appeal to the raw fear and anger of those voters that are, uh, for any reason, unhappy. We are subject to the worst impulses of at least a significant more minority of our voters. And so this, the thing is a metaphor for everything that we're looking at now. Show me here, in my country, with Brexit, in Hungary, in Poland, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the, that appeal to the most base and, and coarse and fears of those voters who feel like they're not being heard. Um, and it's, it's, it's become um, endemic in the West. Right. Of the cuff, I could um, maybe say what I think about uh, this uh, clip. I think uh, it's very much what you said, David, about this scene starting with a uh, uh, mixed race sex scene. So it's a, a white and black body uh, embracing and, and kissing. And so if it's the metaphor of everything is happening in Yonkers, P, the, the, it's not possible for white and black bodies to, to, to mix. And so it, it seems very straightforward. It seems very natural, very simple to people um, going for love. And so the minute afterwards, we uh, there's a discussion about, is it possible to have black bodies in a white district? So white bodies refusing, by all means, black people from entering their, their area. And so there's a, a real contrast between the first scene, which is offering the possibility of uh, uh, white and black bodies to mix, and the second uh, part of the clip, uh, when the mayor is saying, well, let's go back to uh, the old times when the uh, white farmer was sovereign uh, on his land and could uh, could exclude other people from trespassing his property. And, and so the second part is uh, law, making sure that we have a sort of mixity in, in different areas. So my question is very much connected to this, because what we see in this series, uh, which is a very powerful series, is that however strong and powerful institutions are, and here we have a judge which is uh, forcing desegregation uh, in, in, the, in the area. And so we have a young mayor uh, supporting that politics. And at the end, the white uh, population is resisting this so much that they would rather pay fees instead and going to bankruptcy instead of having this uh, public housing being developed in, in white areas. So it is a kind of collective suicide somehow in the name of uh, racial purity. And um, when you started working in the 1990s in France, we had a movie released on our um, areas, poor areas called La and Hatred by Mathieu Kasovitz, and one of the main lines in this uh, film, um, till now everything's okay. So it means that the situation is so fragile, so chaotic, because we don't want to acknowledge that racism exists, that um, the situation is, is, is very tense. I think... Um, this is very much what you do, I think, is catastrophe is looming. And so we, uh, you said that the situation of black people was a, a, a genocide at slow pace. And we, we know how it's going to end. And you have said a few words already. You said that you were disenchanted. But is there some kind of messiah feeling in your work, knowing that the catastrophe is going to be there, Katrina, um, or a missile, or or, or do you think that institutions are so inert that, um, and, and the, the, the institutions are reproducing inequalities so much that it could last forever? There's a big report on 
uh, the Kerner report from 1967 on uh, saying that, okay, you have to uh, be careful because the, the country is being divided. Do you think catastrophe is looming or do you, are you, do you believe in, in, in catastrophe or are you the um, whistleblower of uh, something that has not, cannot be stopped somehow? Um, I, listen, again, I can't, I, I can't be optimistic because things have gone wrong. Um, one of the things that has gone wrong is the, is the corruptions of our information system, that now disinformation is so effective uh, because of social media and, and the decline of mainstream media. Uh, I, I have a, a distinct bias that while mainstream media organizations were far from perfect and had their own inherent structural vulnerabilities, a um, bunch of people sat around in my newsroom trying to figure out what was true and arguing about it. And some of the best moments I can remember as a journalist involved not publishing that which we weren't sure was true. And if you don't think that happened in a professional newsroom, I can tell you it happened every day. Some of the greatest moments in my career happened when I thought I had a story or I, thought, or I was an editor or a rewrite man and we thought we had it right and somebody said, wait a sec, have you considered this? That moment doesn't exist with the internet. The idea that somebody might have one person telling them something and they might wait to get two people. It doesn't, as soon as you hear something, somebody puts it up on the internet. True, false, intentionally false. N nobody's saying it, but let's put it up there anyway because it, you know, what, what, the under, the corruptions of our ability to perceive reality at, in this new century are profound. And they're being, it's being used to great effect against any attempt to address a problem. And it's being used externally by um, forces that are actually arrayed against democracy uh, or, or are arrayed on behalf of profit. Um, so when, when you can't even tell what's true anymore and you can't have a, a dialectic with fellow citizens about what's actually true and what's not true, you're doomed. And that, that's probably job one right now, is to restore our faith in what we read or to, or to be able to discern the difference between agitprop and lies and what is actually true. There's, been, there's more information coming at you as human beings now than ever before in human history. And it's worth less. On the whole, it's worth less. Some of it is incredibly accurate and some of it is designed to destroy accurate. And the ability of the average person to discern this is declining. So if you're asking me what the hope is, I mean, I think catastrophic, it's going to happen in slow doses. But over time, the worst outcomes are, are now more likely than ever. Um, the, the thing about uh, Show Me Hero that I very much was proud of um, was it's one microcosm of America tearing itself up over a basically solvable problem. They were building 200 units of low-income housing in a city of 200,000 people. That's all it was, 200 units, not even all in one place, but scattered in white neighborhoods, eight here, 12 there, 16 here, mixed into a neighborhood so that it doesn't, it's not gonna turn the whole neighborhood poor or the whole neighborhood, it's not gonna flip it racially. It's going to integrate some people who don't have as much with other people who have a little more. And in the end, it was built at great cost over, over a 20-year fight. It, it finally got built. The units are still there. Nothing bad happened. But the, the sheer amount of damage done, uh, and of course the cost to, to the Oscar Isaac character, he was, his political career and, and effectively his life were destroyed by his inability to walk away from his own early rhetoric and then take the honorable position. He was a flawed hero and that he, so what I loved is that it depicted that and the sale point to HBO, just imagine this. I says, you gotta, you gotta let me do this. It's six hours about public housing policy in Yonkers, New York. <laughs> and they went, okay. <laughs> I feel like we stole one from the gods of television when this got made. It's gonna, yeah. Le risque de montrer 
So we'll, we'll try and show another clip, or even two in a row. So, so, so we're moving on chronologically, which shows two clips from the Jews. One is at the end of the seventh or eighth episode of season two, so late 70s, and another one, the other one, is in the middle of season three, so 85, 1985. Both scenes are, are echoing each other in a, very, in, a, in a rather explicit way, I think. It's the porn show. You're going to like this. It's not about housing. But there's issues of housing somehow. Um, but it's a series. The, there has only been three seasons. I, th I think more were planned, but three seasons. There are three um, periods, um, early 70s, late 70s, mid 80s. And it's a series that, do, that follows the development of the porn industry in New York and a and a drastic change in the situation of a neighborhood around Times Square. The two clips that we'll be seeing are both functional, uh, can, can stand on their own, but, but echo each other. And they show someone who's one of the main characters, uh, Eileen or Candy, uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal. So we'll be watching the two clips. So the conversation will end badly and Candy or Eileen will leave. So there's a lot of um, things to say about these two clips and all the things that we've mentioned tonight already, um, especially something that Sylvie insisted on, the, f the, the, the personal journey, if you like. Can one have a journey that is uh, outside of the uh, social determinants, which is a, which is amazing, which is very true of, of the character of Maggie Jinho, because she succeeds through her own means, but why she succeeds is not so much individual heroism, but an intelligence of the milieu that she um, she's in. Her, relation, her, her, her vision of the relation between men and women. I have two more questions. The first is very simple. You were, you were saying, oh, it's porn, it's, everybody's going to like it. For someone who did The Wire, which was male-oriented and austere as, as, a, as a TV series in Baltimore or in New York, I'd like to know what led you to, 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 to work on this project where one can find your, your obsessions, your, your themes, but it's very different. It's a series on prostitution on, and pornography. It's a series where women have a, a, maybe a better place than, than men, or more prominent than men, and a, a, a show that's, that's broaching an issue which is that of um, historic reconstitution, recreation. It's a period piece, somehow, and a series that is um, that is uh, also using music, which is one of your passions. Um, and and there's not a lot of uh, music in the wire. So why? What led you to this side to, to that to taking that sidestep? And the second question and something that I find really unique in these two clips. Um, we know that the show that you work on are interesting also through time, and time means that things can be accumulated, can be constructed, can be built on. But time also allows you um, to show this pornographer um, uh, talking with um, with a feminist group or a group um, of women against pornography, and her, the person she's talking to is a is a feminist um, activist, very famous in the states, and she and, and this woman or this pornographer is invited to talk to them, and something that was um, 
And, and so we have a, a tail where, where f basically what we have here is that we have a reversal of fiction where the wolf is being, basically the, the story of the wolf is being turned over. And then that is being critiqued um, one season later. And yes, Candy leaves, and Candy recognizes the fact, acknowledges the fact that what she's heard was um, was 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 right, and she there is a self criticism from Candy. So in a way, what she shows is that a show can 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 look at itself and critique itself. But the question also is, why the juice? Money um, shot. Okay, this this show came about because. Uh, George Pelkanis and I were working on Treme and a crew member um, who had been trying to develop these true stories about Times Square and the rise of porn uh, in America. Guys who were there um, at the, um, <laughs> for lack of a better term, the seminal moment of, 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 of pornography, of, of, of modern industrial entertainment industry pornography. Um, uh, He'd been trying to develop these stories. He knew the guy who was played by James Franco in the piece. Um, he knew that guy. And the guy was still around. And he said, you got to hear him. you got to come to New York. you got to hear the stories. You're going to want to do the show. And George and I said, oh, man, you know, this sounds really gratuitous. Um, so we put him off, and we put him off. And eventually, we ended up in a room listening to the guy's stories. The, you know, the, uh, Mark Johnson persevered. He said, you know, so we ended up starting to hear his stories. And after about four hours, George and I took a walk out of, out of the room in New York and, and walked around the block. We said, my God, we're going to have to write a story about porn. Um, because it's not a sidestep. It's the same argument brought forth, you know, substitute the universe. And it's about human beings being worth less. It's, it's about the decline and the, and the, um, the isolation of labor. Um, in this case, sex workers and, and, and adult stars and, or adult actors. Um, and it's also about, the, about the, um, the, basically where the money goes, where the money from labor goes. I mean, it's a, it's a critique of the exact construct, but you get to watch it. You get to watch an industry actually come from being, sure, was there pornography before? Uh, 1970, yeah, but it was illegal, and it was it was um, it was below the counter in a brown, brown paper bag, and uh, and constantly raided and not mass produced, and not by the time they were done, it was going to be beamed into everybody's home. You weren't going to have to go to the dirty movie theater. Everybody was going to be consuming it eventually right off the internet. So if you follow it through, if you follow the piece through, you actually you watch an industry create itself in dramatic form, and then you see who got the money, who got the, who got the validation, and where everybody ended up. It was a perfect metaphor for a critique of late-stage capitalism. Um, so that's the reason for it. Um, plus, the stories were just great. The characters that this guy brought forward, you know, we, we just went straight off. He, he had taped dozens, maybe 100, maybe 150 stories about um, what he remembered uh, of, of all the people of, of that demi -mont. So that's why it happened. Um, when we came to HBO, we were laughing. We said, tell them it's a porn show. They, they should, they're going to green light this one so fast it'll make your head spin. But they were actually, to their great credit, they were actually a little bit wary of it being gratuitous. And if you watch the whole show, what I'm most proud of is, um, Whenever people don't have their clothes on, particularly if it's a, um, a scene that's involving sex work or pornography, as opposed to two characters who actually love each other and are in a relationship, but if it's, if it's really depicting the production of prostitution or if it's the product, if it's depicting the product, um, the camera will not linger so long as to indulge the viewer. You're not going to be able to get off on it, or at least if you do, you're really working overtime. It's not, 
It's not pretty. We, we, we unprettied it. it. I mean, the clip you saw is kind of not, it's Candy's own version of what Candy wants porn to be. So it's, it's actually an inversion of the way you see porn in maybe, you know, 95% of the other shots in the film. Or the camera will not avert itself so quickly that you're just alluding to what pornography or prostitution is. The camera will stay there so that the, un the discomfort and, the, and the, the, the dehumanization will at least be part of your, sh your, your, your experience. So not so long as to indulge anybody and not so short as to deny what we're talking about. And we had to think about that every single shot all along the way, and it was discussions with the actors, the directors, the editors. Uh, it was, by the time you got to the end of it, in America, there was no critic saying, well, this was a, a, an indulgent and um, gratuitous exercise. Because listen, so much of America, American entertainment, I'm talking about like straight television, straight film, it, it plays on the pornographic. You know, we've all learned the pornographic subtext of, of film. You know, Madison Avenue uses it to sell beer in cars. So this has all been, in, you know, 40, 40, 50 years of legal pornography has put this into our cultural DNA. It's there whether you want to admit it or not. So we wanted to examine that, and it was a real interesting opportunity to do it. And I'm very proud of the shot-by-shot -shot decisions that are made about what you see and what you don't in, in, in the piece. Just to say a word on the scene, we've just seen on the few minutes that follow, because the scene is a little longer, that the feminist activist tells that um, um, filmmaker, you telling me I've succeeded, I'm a strong woman, I have power, and I'm trying to direct or show female desire. And because I have money and power, I, I show that pornography can be feminist. And there are, there have been debates, and there are debates on, uh, in, in, in American feminism on this. And what the feminist says, she says, um, the anecdotal doesn't count. And then she adds, the anecdotal is the problem. And, and it, 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 it echoes what we're telling about cinema and, and, and what David Simon does. The individual narrative does not represent the universal. Just be, and what she, the, the feminist says, because you're a strong woman, because you are an individual that has succeeded, does, it doesn't mean that all women have to um, support, have to, um, to, to suffer the degrading image of women that is being um, diffused by pornography. And, and the excuse that one has succeeded, it, the fact that one has succeeded is no excuse and doesn't mean that everyone can succeed. And it is something that one can find in David Simon's work. And I, tr I, I, I thought I could, Im I thought there was a bit of a mise en abîme or a parallel where maybe David Simon in this scene was showing himself, presenting himself, the white um, director or the white writer who has, who has um, talked a lot about uh, black people. And I could imagine David Simon showing clips uh, of The Wire to black uh, kids. And I know some researchers have shown um, the wire to, um, to 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 guys from the ghetto, and maybe I could Im I could uh, I could imagine David Simon asking kids from the ghetto what they thought of the representation of Omar, for instance, or, or, or other characters. And is there? And I think that David Simon's work is scrupulous. The the work of David Simon wants to make sure that someone who is being represented will see his work and say the anecdote that you are telling is hurting me. And David Simon doesn't apologize for what he does, but I think maybe this scene is a mise en abîme of the work that he does himself by representing those who are not like him. And there is a consideration there, an artistic care and consideration, the fact that someone might say the anecdote that you are telling does not uh, it cannot be excused because you do fiction and you are, this anecdote maybe is hurting us. That's interesting. Um, 
I hadn't thought about that. Um, extrapolating, maybe. Um, mostly, that scene came about because we felt the need at some point in the piece to give Andrea, the, Andrea Dworkin, and that's who that character was, um, who was one of the fundamental founders of, of uh, Women Against Pornography, her say. Um, that was a group, Women Against Pornography, that actually split uh, at a critical point over the First Amendment and over the, the notion of whether or not there, there could be uh, female-centric erotica uh, that was not pornographic but merely erotica. And some people walked away from the group um, or uh, on the premise of they could not abide by, because eventually Dworkin made common cause with the Reagan administration in an attempt to um, find ways to censor pornography in, in ways that ultimately were unconstitutional based on, based on our freedom of the press. So it actually split the group, but we felt the need to give voice to Dworkin's critique of pornography, which was pretty damn precise. She understood what it, what it was conveying in terms of male fantasy and what it was delivering um, in terms of dehumanization of the subject. Um, of, of, uh, or the sub, not only the, 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 the actresses, but the, um, of sexuality. And in doing so, um, we also felt like Candy, who was laboring to find her own voice in this very misogynistic culture, um, could not successfully speak for the culture as a whole. So thinking about what you just said, I definitely cannot defend American television from about any charge that you want to level on it. I mean, you know, we, we've given you everything from Gilligan's Island to um, to, to a, a million myriad cop shows where they're hunting people of color, to uh, to Dallas, to, to you know, to explorations of vast wealth as being entertainment uh, value to. To, to, the, to the near pornographic or pornographic. Um, I don't make common cause. I would rather defend journalism, even though I don't live there anymore. I can have that argument. I make my home where I do, but I have no interest in defending it. So in some respect, um, I can only speak for my own product. I am in the same circumstance as Candy, who's trying to explain the, the film she made, which she feels like she can defend as being uh, her, gen her genuinely female perspective. Um, as far as the whole notion of, oh shit, it's a white guy making films and he's got these actors of color and it's, it's, it's universes he has. I also haven't been a, 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 a recon marine. I never invaded Iraq. I have no military training. Uh, I never ran a housing project or I never lived in a housing project. Um, I've never been a sex worker. Um, I have not, uh, I've not been a drug dealer, I've not been a cop. Um, I am a storyteller. Uh, and I, if I start making apologies for everything that I'm not, I'd never get the first word out. I do not believe you need to be in a given cohort to tell a given story. Thank God they let the Gentiles write the Jews or we wouldn't have Schindler's List. Thank God they let the, um, the boys write the girls, or we wouldn't have Madame Bovary. You know, it, it, the only thing that matters, and, and this is not to say that people whose voices have not had access to storytelling, people of color, uh, women, uh, you know, people of varying sexualities, that they haven't been underrepresented, that we don't need to hear everybody's voice, that the collective doesn't need to be wide and varied. It absolutely does. But in the end, when you come down to depicting an individual piece of writing, the only question is, is it good or is it not? Did it work or did it not? Is it credible or is it not? Is it true in the, in the sense of art or is it not? That's, that's the only metric that can work in the end. Once the writing's there, it's like, if the guy, if he's full of shit, bang him, you know, tell him it's, full of shit, and you, you, that's not the way it is. That's the great horror of any writer who has any, any shame, is 
we call it imposter syndrome. Do you have, do you know what that is? Writers talk about it. Imposter syndrome is, what gave me the right to come to the campfire with this story? I don't know, but I did. Here's my story. I hope it's good. I hope you don't, but you know, at any given moment, anyone can say, you're an imposter. I've lived that life and you're an imposter. And the only thing that protects you is, did you do enough research? Did you capture the voice? Did, is what you had to say worth saying about that world? And that, you just gotta be judged on the merits or, or discarded on the merits. And there's no other way around it until, the only alternative is, the only person writing about you know, a red-headed Republican uh, Inuit from the north of Alaska can be another red-headed Republican Inuit from the north of Alaska. I mean, if you follow it down to its logic, nobody can, there's no common human, humanity to, to chase. So that's a big argument for our time. Um, I'm genuinely uninterested in it. I just spoke to it probably with more um, attention because your question was interesting than, than, I've, than I actually want to speak to it. Because if it's up to me, I just, here's the work, it'll either stand or it won't. Donc comme l'heure tourne un petit peu, et avant d'ouvrir, sans doute pour le dernier quart d'heure, les questions à la salle, on a, la, on a une autre chance aujourd'hui. There's something else that we, we're lucky that we can do today, is to show you the trailer of a project of David Simons that will be coming out very shortly. Um, it's, it's an adaptation of The Plot Against America, the 2004 Philip Roth novel, and broadcast is starting mid-March with um, John, John Turturro and, and, and other actors. So the, the, tra the trailer was shown on the net um, on a few a few days ago, and I want to thank the, the channel OCS for, for, for enabling us to show it today. So it's a comedy. When we prepared this talk, we uh, talked uh, with Emmanuel on how to, to uh, tackle this new project, as this your uh, new project. And um, thinking about it, I realized that this meeting between Philip Roth and, and you uh, was absolutely necessary. You had to uh, to meet your your work, your body of work had to uh, to come together. And so on this new project, well, I'm, I'll, I'll go very quickly. It's a dystopia uh, about uh, how in 1940 Charles Lindbergh, the very famous. Uh, hero uh, who's very close to the Nazi party and Hitler is actually winning the 1940 um, election and so how gradually America um, is, is turning to Nazism and so it's seen through a Jewish family from Newark and they uh, disagree on how and, and how and if they need to trust this new president and who's launching a new program who wants to assimilate uh, American Jews to uh, to the country. And so uh, there's a program called uh, People Like Us in uh, Ross novel. And so it's taking uh, Jewish people individually to uh, disseminate them uh, in on the American territory. And so the idea is to, yeah, disseminate Jewish people so that they melt with so that there's no more a Jewish specificities and so the uh, Jewish family delivers is, is breaking up and so each of one of them is is has a word to say about the the catastrophe and so I think there's a, a similar points in David Ross novels and um, to what you have developed in your in your own work and so he's David um, Philip Roth is, is talking about uh, the suburbs of New York and so it's in pastoral uh, pastorale in in and, and then suddenly catastrophe uh, um, 
appears. And so there's a very strong connection for him with your work. And so the epex is dying, the tragedy is moving forward. And so the uh, idea of assimilation, the price to bed to become American, is, is, is very clear, very clearly put. So I had two questions for you on this uh, subject. First, we don't talk about identities that much. And you're not very much interested in talking about your own personal history. But about this project, you said that you yourself um, come from a, a Jewish family, American family, very um, very politicized, and there's a lot of echoes to that in uh, Philip Ross's work, in uh, the fascination for Lindbergh. I think your uh, own father um, went to a Lindbergh uh, show, and even though he uh, hated him, and, and, and so does it make sense for you to work on that particular part, on that particular hero or, or character who's part of your history, and also to uh, work on social justice? And my second question is how, well, you, you filmed a lot in uh, these city centers where there's a lot of violence, where well, live a majority of Americans, but of course it's, there's always confrontations with the other. And so how did you film the suburbs of Newark? And uh, so how could you film this area uh, as protected from the evils of the cities? And did you manage to do that, or uh, did you uh, let Philip Roth's work speak first in, in, in a way? So how did you yeah, manage to uh, tackle Philip Roth's work in, in, in regard to your work? Um, the answer to the last part is you have to honor Roth's work. At that point, I'm delivering, um, you know, if you, if you pick up a book and you're trying to make it, it doesn't mean that you have to be literal. If anyone's ever seen anyone try to make a literal page by page, you know, uh, film of a book, you know it doesn't work. You have to find, film is a shorthand language. You have to find a way of slicing the book differently in order to make it work. But your, your responsibility, if you pick up a book, I think, is to, um, is to convey the theme and convey the purpose, the existential purpose of the book. So it's not the first book I've adapted. You know, Generation Kill was a book. Show Me a Hero was a, was a book. This was the first novel. But it's a very explicit novel in terms of this, um, this dystopic moment in which he imagines an America turning to fascism at a critical moment in, in 20th century history. Um, and my own personal, you know, my own personal politics are I'm, I'm definitely against fascism. You, you can put me down on that. So I didn't have to approach it from... On a attendu dans la discussion pour en être sûr. Exactly. You never know. You never know. So, but, I'm, you know, I'm coming in... I mean, we're all... We all have the perfect hindsight of knowing siding with fascism in 1940 was probably not where you wanted to be as a human being. And that's what... That's what the, the, the moment is confronting. So uh, you sort of, you already know where to stand. In terms of my own personal history, um, I did not experience, you know, I'm born in 1960. I did not experience, a, 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 and I, I grew up in a relatively liberal count, county uh, just out over the District of Columbia line in, in Washington. Um, so I didn't experience a great deal of personal anti-Semitism. I didn't live through uh, the Holocaust moment, uh, even as a bystander. Uh, I was in, I came into the, I mean, I'm very conscious of my Jewish identity and of, of, of 20th century Jewish history and, you know, in fact, of all, but I'm secular. I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't believe in God. So I'm, I'm coming at it with, with, with a certain amount of uh, attenuation. But my father, as you pointed out, my father his earliest, one of his earliest memories as a kid that he was able to convey to me was 1927. Lindbergh comes back from having flown the Atlantic. He's a world hero. He flew it alone. You know, nobody said it could be done. He did it. And his father, my grandfather, um, who by this time had probably learned enough English, you know, but, you know, came over here speaking Yiddish, uh, my father from Russia, 
went through the tubes from Jersey City to lower Manhattan and held my seven-year-old father on his shoulders so my father could see Lindbergh coming down Broadway in the ticker tape parade. He was the greatest hero a kid could have when you were that age. He was the greatest hero living that Americans had at that moment of 1927. Not 12 years later, my father is 19, and Lindbergh is the devil. Lindbergh, Roosevelt's terrified that the Republicans will nominate him to run against him in 1940 and that he will win. Um, and Lindbergh is advocating for isolationism, um, for uh, a certain sympathy for the achievements of fascism in Germany and, and Italy, uh, for non-intervention in the war that's broken out uh, between the Soviet Union, uh, France, and, and, and Britain, and, and the Axis powers, and for fear of the other. And in this case, the allegory is the, the other here are Jews, because in 1940, that was the vulnerable group for that moment in history. But the reason to make this film is not to revisit my father's history as a Jewish American or mine. Um, Yes, we are now in a moment of increasing anti-Semitism around the world, and that's to be noted. Uh, it, it goes hand in hand with these levels of nationalistic rhetoric and of um, fear-mongering and of, of attempts to divide people. But the people who are really vulnerable in my country right now are people with black and brown skin, as witnessed what's happening at my southern border. Uh, where, you know, there's a horror show going on in terms of people being, you know, what's being said about Mexicans or, or Muslims in terms of immigration. The fear of the other is, is fuel for this political moment. So that's the reason to make this, is, is, is you, I'm hoping people follow the allegory. I don't know why they wouldn't. I mean, in, in the film, Lindbergh is a uh, president spouting populist pro-American Literally, the phrase, America first, was one uttered by the historical Lindbergh and his supporters. And, and, and America first has an antecedent, which is the actual isolationist movement of 1939, 1940, 1941, before Pearl Harbor brought us into the war. America first, that is the historical f f reference. You know, you may have heard it recently. It may have come from some politician's mouth. Um, and that politician has run 100 miles uh, demonizing the other and making you afraid of what's uh, just over the border and people who are different from you. He has managed to metastasize that fear into political success. So that's the reason that this book, um, that's, that, that's the provenance that matters for this book, not that it's Jews, but that that, that metaphor works or not that I'm Jewish, but that metaphor works for this political moment if you accept the power of metaphor. Right, so we have a bit less than 15 minutes, or maybe a bit more, I don't know. People are waving at me, but I don't know them. Anyway, so there's a mic going on in uh, the room, and I see many people who want to say something. And of course, we don't accept fascist questions, or at least not for the first ones. Uh, Baptiste, I let you. Um, right, good evening. Well, it's, it's hard to talk first, but anyway. In your series with uh, music, which is not part of the story, uh, with people and, and your characters' lives, it, it sometimes looks like documentary. Have you never thought of doing documentary? Nobody taught me documentary. <laughs> I didn't stumble into it. I did journalism, which is weirdly a cousin to the prose journalism, which is weird, weird. And I did narrative, where you would, you know, I went to a homicide unit for a year to write a book. I went to a drug corner for a year to write another book. What could be more Frederick Wiseman like documentary than that in prose? It's like, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll hang out for a really long time and then I'll write a story. 
that feels like documentary. So it's sort of funny that I didn't. If ever I was going to go to film naturally from journalism, I, that would be the natural progression. It's an accident of history, um, of my personal history, not history that matters, but my personal history is I wrote a book that was effectively a prose documentary of homicide detectives, got bought by a dramatic film director, Barry Levinson. He made it into a television drama. They came to town. They asked me if I wanted to write a script. I said, yeah, uh, I'll try. Um, they asked me if I wanted to write another. My newspaper was starting to go downhill. And I decided I'll do this for a couple of years while I finish my second book, and it'll be, it'll be interesting. I'll learn a new skill set. So that's what I learned. I learned the make-believe part of it. And the only thing that I could do then with what I learned was, well, it'll still be make-believe, but I'll try, to, I'll try to honor what I think is true. I won't, I won't give in to um, what could be the best and most perfect entertainment. You know, I, I won't, if the, if, the, if the perfect entertainment is over here, somehow I'll find a way to ruin it. And, and, and in that way, I'll be not ashamed at the end of the day. But that's really what happened. It was not, like, if I was not a career plan. It was a, oh, this opened. I can do this for a while, you know. Okay. You know, so that's that. Were you speaking about the music that we never use score? Right. Um, it's not entirely true, but by and large, we never like to use musical score. We don't like, I don't want to tell you what to think based on when the, when the strings start to swell up or when the drums start to pound. Um, and I don't want a script that the perfect song is always on the jukebox when something happens. Because there was a great, there was a great moment in Mean Streets by Martin Scorsese where Johnny Boy is beating the shit out of a guy with a pool cue in the bar. And Be My Baby by the Ronettes is playing. Like the wrong song. And somebody asked Scorsese about it, and he said, I'll never forget, he said, they asked him in an interview, and he said, well, the, the right song is never always on the jukebox when you're ready to beat the shit out of a guy with a pool cue. <laughs> That's real life, you know? So, like, when I heard that, I was like, okay, you know? That's good. That's good. And so, so you, you know, you don't want the music fighting moments, but you don't want it always agreeing with it or, or, or telling the moment over again in lyric. So that becomes its own skill set. Where's the music coming from? Is there an open window? Is there a car by? How much, how many... How much does it feel like score? How much does it just feel random? These are all choices that we make. And um, it's fun. It's fun to do that. Uh, and it's, it imposes a discipline on the film. At the end of seasons, we often have a montage, but then you're coming out of the movie to reflect on it. It's, it's the one moment where we allow ourselves, uh, you know, by and large, I mean, the, we, we violate the rule when we want it, but mostly we, we, we hew to it. So. I have a question on Tremi that you haven't mentioned, which is one of my favorites. And if I'm not mistaken, the fourth season should have had 10 episodes. There's only five. So my question is on the writing. How do you go from 10 to five episodes? How do you, um, how do you put everything into five episodes? And still end the the show with the and the last shot is sublime. Thank you for liking Treme. Uh, if <laughs> if you are if you are um, if you do this for a living, they're all your children, and and you know if you're a parent, the one that nobody really appreciates, you kind of lean into a little more. So um, I'm very proud of Treme. Treme is 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 an argument not merely for culture, but for the, Ameri for the idea of the city. Uh, it's, it's about a lot more than people presumed when, when they were watching it. It's the idea that we're not going back to some sort of agrarian perfection, even though that's actually still the politics of my country. Like, there's a real America, you know, some American Gothic mythical farmland where white people, you know, till the land and, you know, look at each other with, you know, benign, Faith in, in, you know, I mean, the, the, Hitler sold this shit with, you know, the Volk and, and, the, and the agrarian ideal. And 
You know, we'll be, we're going to, human beings are going to be packed into cities, you know, of 30 million and more, increasingly multi multi-pluralistic, increasingly packed together, people who, you know, various religions, various uh, cultures, cuisines, uh, languages, and we're going to either figure it out or we're not. And so when people came out of the wire saying, well, man, Baltimore's fucked up. Why don't they just leave? Or, you know, I would get out of there. I couldn't believe people were taking that as, you know, there, there's no getting out of the future of, we're either figuring out the city or, or we're, not land, we're not landing it as a species. So Treme was very much an argument of this is what you can achieve uh, almost from scratch, from a city that had drowned, that nearly been drowned. Um, this is what, this is what the, a culture that could only exist in a place where different people were compacted and offering different things and, and cross-pollinating. This is what can be achieved. And I'm really, so thank you for bringing it up. Um, that we lost five episodes at the end because no one was watching it. Maybe because I didn't give that speech well enough. <laughs> but nobody, nobody was watching it. And, and HBO was like, you know, we love you, but we're really dying here on Sunday night. And so it was a negotiation. You gotta let me finish. You gotta let me turn these characters. I gotta have the last piece where we speak to what's at stake and, and the characters finish their arcs. And, and they gave me four, and I figured out a way to give some of my own money back. Nina, my co-producer, Nina Noble, who, who she figured out a way to find half the money for an extra episode, and I gave half the money back. From, from my own development deal, um, just to get that fifth episode. And whether or not we were successful, are the, there are the things that I left out, things that I wanted to say, yeah, there's always more. It's like closets in a house, you know? However many they give you, you're gonna fill them up. So we did what we could. We did what we could, but you know, it's always the case. I lost two episodes at the end of The Wire. Uh, it was supposed to be 10 and had to go down to eight. Can't complain, because that same, fiscal year, same budget year, they gave me Show Me Hero. So I really got 15 hours of budgeted out of HBO. But could I have used the extra two hours? Yeah, you'd have, you'd have found out that um, uh, the one kid, uh, Randy, was, was, um, was uh, uh, oh shit, what characters' names? Um, Method, supposed to be Method's kid. Wagstaff was the last name. We, we were, that was eventually a reveal that we had to shave off. We couldn't go, you know, some limbs had to get shaved. They always, you're always cutting off limbs to fit. It's always the way it is. Earlier, you were talking about a form of, of, of integrity, of honesty in your research. And, and you're one of the only showrunners that is being studied in aesthetic, in philosophy, in political philosophy or aesthetic philosophy at the Sorbonne. Ça veut dire que ouais, c'est je suis mort au niveau de la carrière. La philosophie, c'est la mort. And my question is, to what extent structure, because you're talking about the loss of five episodes, to what to what extent uh, structure is important for you as an author to express ideas and to convey what you want to say? Um, most of television, uh, this is just a, I mean, there, and there are people who violate this and get past it, so I'm not the only, I'm not acting like I'm the only guy or anything like that, but by and large, there's so much money in television. If you can keep a show up, and garner an audience and hold that, hold that platform for four, five, six years, syndication, cable reruns, um, you, you, the back end of your deal growing with every successive contract. You know, There's so much money in having a sustained franchise that who, the resistance to that of, no, 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 this show has a, a, an end. I, I has this, the story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and I don't want to go past that. You know, wait a sec, you actually have a hit. 10 million people are watching you. Give us more of what you just did. If you think about story, the, the open-ended story of, oh, you like Omar? Well, here's some more. You like Stringer? Here's some more. Str you know, that's not how stories 
are supposed to exist. That's not what storytelling is about. But the, the medium of television and episodic, it's not film. You don't just film one film and, you know, okay, that's the story I hope it sells. You're in this dialectic with your audience of like, you're watching and you like that? My ratings went up? Oh, more of that. Um, that's problematic. And so one of the things that, you know, one of the things we've always tried to do is write the last scene first. If any of you got to the end of the deuce, the last scene was written before anything else in the three seasons. And it was planned, actually. It was not planned. Three seasons and out. We told HBO, if for some weird reason, this is the show that everybody watches, not that it's ever happened before, but if, if for some weird reason we actually have an audience, we're out in three seasons. Don't ask for a fourth, because we'll be, start to be redundant. Everything we, we will needed to say about the mass communications model that is pornography and what it represents, soci socially, politically, whatever, we'll have done it once. We'll have done it on the jump from uh, porno houses to VHS tapes in everybody's living room. I don't need to go to the internet. I don't need to go to another decade. I've said what, you know, it'll all have been evident. I, I don't need to do the same dance twice. So that, that's a discipline too of saying no but then the converse is, oh, please, I, I need three and a half seasons at a minimum. Please let me have the extra half. Please let me get to the end. Please don't make me have come this whole way and not be able to write my endings because that's, that's horrifying in its own. The Wire was canceled after season, after season three. And to HBO's credit, I got to go back in and beg Chris Albrecht for another season. And then I got to go back in and beg after season four to finish with five. So that was a unique experience at a network that was willing to listen um, and could sustain, they weren't, they didn't have to sell my stuff to advertisers, it was a different model. So I got away with it, but I sure didn't have an audience and it almost curtailed the last two seasons of The Wire. Bonjour. People were talking about philosophy, but you're also studying political sociology. Uh, so not, not only philosophy, but also sociology, where, where you're being studied, and I'm sure other subjects. Uh, but you said that you spend a year on a corner or with the police. These are study or research methods that, that are that echo sociology or the Chicago School. Can you see bridges between your work and sociology? Are you giving a sociological discourse in your, in your work? I know what the Chicago School is, and I've read, you know, I've read many a monograph of, you know, I mean, the, one of the classic books before we did The Corner was Tally's Corner in Washington, a very famous work of ethnography. I even learned the word ethnography, um, which I didn't know before. I, like I was doing an ethnography, before I knew what it was. Um, and there's something about academics, God bless them, where um, when you stumble upon the same inherent logic, um, but you're not an academic, they give you a pat on the head like you, like you figured out, you know, like, like you just figured out the theory of relativity. You know, I, you know what I want to do? I want to go to a, a neighborhood that's saturated with drugs and I want to follow the people who are struggling there and I'm gonna follow them long enough that I gain enough of their trust that I'm, a, I'm able to depict the narratives of, of their lives to the best of my ability. And I won't get up and leave until I, I have sufficient data in, you know, and, and, and information and narrative in order to, to achieve that. I call that journalism, you know? And they're like, primitive, yes, but you know, you're also doing, you know, without knowing anything of your actual intentions. And that was really how a lot of sociology, it, it was really like, that's marvelous that you figured that out, you know. And I wanted to say, you know, it's marvelous that you guys add a bunch of footnotes and publish in your own little journals and don't think that you're involved in some act of, of, of primal journalism, you know. You're, you're, you guys are journalists, except you can't write really well. That's what I wanted to, <laughs> I mean, that's really, that was the tonality of, of a lot of sociology, especially on the corner. On homicide, no, because that was just me following cops, and it didn't have to be taken as seriously um, by, by sociologists or by academics. Um, but, but yeah, that happened on the corner, and 
that was that was a kick actually. Um, so for a while, I got passed around as sort of a party favor at at schools of sociology, and you know they, they'd invite me, and they'd always introduce me as if I like it, you know, you know. And this pointed head, pointed head little devil, he figured out what we do. Didn't do it as well. It's not as precise, but you know, give him credit. You know, it was like that kind of. Bon, il nous reste le temps pour une. Euh, ouais. Uh, hi. Pour une question, je pense, si vous voulez bien. Um, Just one I'm last kind of question. surprised by uh, the sort of pessimism uh, that you have on the actual world and the future that you, you developed uh, your, your view upon the actual world and you seem to me actually quite pessimist and I'm quite kind of surprised because it sort of contrasts with the balanced somehow tone of uh, your shows which are always uh, sort of mixed between a, a lot of bad things and a lot of good things and uh, and uh, positive uh, perceptions of reality and um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm kind of asking myself uh, if uh, and I think that this balanced view is what actually uh, what makes social sciences so keen about your shows uh, but the thing is do you think that somehow, that the same way you told that when you were a journalist, you get a story done, and the guy does actually the, the opposite of what you were telling, and but and your shows when they are out, you they are not watched uh, immediately. So maybe there is somehow a delayed effect of what you have. You, maybe you have um, contributed to have built a delayed effect on your shows and that is perceived nowadays through things like the most visible, visible thing maybe the candidature of Bernie Sanders. So don't you think that you might contribute to actually build another vision of, uh, of the world through the shows that you are uh, constructing? I don't know. I, I can only build what I can build, sadly. Um, and I can, all, you know, it's, it's like if I could build a better a, a show that people watched initially and state, you know, then I would actually have a lot more vulnerability, uh, a lot less vulnerability to market forces. I wish I could build a show that people watch right away. I wouldn't have to answer to um, to the to the the vagaries of the marketplace. Um, I think the shows have delayed impact only because you don't know what you watched in full until you've seen the arc. Um, a lot of people, in, in the beginning of Treme, we lost a lot of viewers, and it was said initially, this is a, uh, there were a lot of reviews the first episode, and everybody strained. Maybe the most political moment in that show was John Goodman ranting at a BBC film crew and trying to throw their camera in the Mississippi River because they asked him an obnoxious question about New Orleans and its importance. And a bunch of people said, that David Simon, he is an angry motherfucker. He is angry and listen to him rant and this is, this is didactic and, okay, so John Goodman was, three things, John Goodman was actually voicing the rantings of a famous blogger who had come to be the voice of New Orleans um, in the immediate aftermath of Katrina. He was, he was a guy whose voice was actually much heralded by people in the city, because he was just venting in the same way um, and using the same language. Two, Eric Overmeyer wrote that piece, not me. And three, um, it represented the genuine anger of, of people in New Orleans uh, who felt isolated and you know, were hearing stuff in the vernacular, you know, why rebuild it, it's below sea level, and they were hearing this stuff. It was actually being said in the halls of Congress. So, like, oh, and four, that character, Sorry, tease, uh, I'm going to ruin it for you. Character is shown to be incredibly depressed and mentally challenged. By the end of the piece, it's obvious. He's saying some, some of the things he's saying are so wrong. Like, one of the things he says is, um, San Francisco is a cesspool with hills. He, like, vents that. I, I'm sorry, I, neither me nor Eric Overmeyer think San Francisco is a cesspool with hills. It's a very beautiful city. Yeah. yeah. yeah but... The clues are there that he might not be a reliable narrator, and yet everyone thought they knew what the show was going to feel like and be long before that character self-destructed, long before the show got to tell its tale, long before the show got to critique New Orleans in its excesses and its vulnerabilities and its corruptions. They thought they knew what they had from the jump. 
That's the problem of episodic television is, you know, you give the critics one or two, and they got to go with what they got. I don't, almost don't blame them. They got to go with what they think. But everything gets strained through people's presumptions of what you're building. So that's the reason why if you came back on Treme after it was all assembled and you looked at it as, as a piece, as a whole, I think it stands up against anything we've done. If you were judging it from episode one, you were saying, this guy's yelling at me and I don't like it, and also it's not the wire. And, <laughs> you know, okay, if, you know, it's not, so, you know. Mathieu, tu dire un mot pour la fin? Je sais que j'ai récupéré le métro pour annoncer la suite du programme, mais je m'autorise du coup une dernière question. Right, just uh, before I, I tell you the rest of the program, uh, I have a question. So it's a question about The Wire. So Sylvie Laurent and Emmanuel Bordeaux haven't seen that series, so that's why they couldn't talk about it. No, I'm joking. But anyway, so during uh, all through... Um, uh, these three days we spent with you, I was very much struck that when you speak about Generation Kill, um, your idea is actually uh, not to make a, a war movie, a war series, where we uh, hold war dear somehow because we're feeling close to their characters. When you're talking about the deuce, you, you say that your I, what you want is not to um, generate desire in, in your viewers. And so you, you want to prevent that empathy moment when people are going to uh, go against what you want to do. And so I have a question about the uh, wire, about Omar, because it's a very, um, it's very cool uh, character and is is very bright and and, and and very lucid. And so, I've always thought that to do what you do, in fact, you chose the worst format is the series because in series you you identify with characters. You you cannot do you cannot but like uh, characters. And so, I was wondering if this was the reason why you had this Omar character as a um, message of gratitude to uh, viewers. Nah, fuck the viewers. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> they either come or they don't. No, uh, Omar, the origin of Omar is Ed Burns, my writing partner uh, on The Wire, was a homicide detective who did wiretap cases, did a lot of narcotics violence work, uh, drug murders and stuff. And he found early in his career, going back to like 79, that there is a subculture, there's an actual subculture of guys who rob dealers, which would seem like it's a very dangerous profession. And it is on one level. On the other hand, since you can come back on the dealer as easy as he can, you know, a lot of dealers, if they're making enough money, they write off a certain amount of lost packages to spillage. It's, you know, it's the nature of, you know, there's a lot of these guys who go for years. And um, Ed found that they were, because they go for years, because they have incredible intelligence about where the stash houses are, who's selling what, who's selling for whom, who works for whom, who's muscle. They know all this stuff because it's their livelihood. They're great informants. Plus, you can always catch them with a gun. They got to be armed. So you can always get them on a gun charge. And so he, in the course of Ed's career, Anthony Holly, Ferdinand Harvin, uh, Cadillac and Lowe, they, these were guys who gave him great information as a, as a police officer. And so we created a character based on these guys because they were so interesting. And I, I wrote a story about one of the guys who turned state's evidence for Ed in a big case in 1988, in the Warren Bordley case, it was a guy named Donnie Andrews. Donnie was in federal prison, I went out to interview him, I wrote a long magazine article about what the culture of robbing drug dealers and how that works. Um, and it's a great character. So like we, when we're, you're doing the drug universe, why not create a guy like that? How did Omar become Omar? Cadillac and Lowe were a uh, team, one guy, one younger guy, that went for about 11 years in West Baltimore, robbing drug dealers. Those, those were their street names, Cadillac and Lowe. The way Ed told the stories to me, I didn't know these two guys. I knew Donnie, I met Anthony Holly, I, you know, I never knew Cadillac and Lowe. The way Ed told me the story, I thought they were gay lovers. And so I, when it came to sit down and write Omar, I wrote him gay because I thought, 
It's very hard to be gay and be in the police department at that time, a lot of homophobia. Very hard to be gay in an organized drug hierarchy, you know, a lot of homophobia. You're out on the street robbing drug dealers alone, you can be anything you damn want, you know? At the end of a gun, I'll be anything, I, you know, I'll be openly gay, fuck you. So it seemed like a good place to explore that, and it, that's a fictional moment that I just threw together. To make a long story short, um, at some point, Ed looks at it on the page and goes, it's interesting you made him gay. And I, and I went, well, Cadillac and Lowe. And he looked at me and went, they weren't gay. <laughs> <laughs> so I got it wrong. Um, but then to, to conclude this with a, a last little joke is Donnie Andrews later got out of prison. Um, and he later married Fran Boyd from the corner, which is a whole nother story that we can't get into now. But he, he, was, you know, he got out of prison. He, he stayed close with Ed and, and you know, he was, he, he was an amazing cat, but after serving a lot of time uh, in that case where he, he worked for Ed, because he, he had done a murder, um, which he you know, regretted, he actually regretted shooting, probably did several murders, but that was one he did on spec for a drug dealer. He had taken a turn in his, so he really regretted it. And he lived, a, he came out and went straight for the last decade of his life. Anyway, when he came out, he was standing around on the set of The Wire. Donnie actually is in The Wire, as sort of the heavyset guy that befriends Omar in prison. That's the real Donnie. That's the real Omar, or a guy who is 60% of Omar. Anyway, Donnie gets out, very laconic delivery, and he's watching the set. He goes, and you know, he's like, he's trying to be polite. He's trying to be egalitarian. He's not, he's not anti anything, but you know, he has some sense of himself. And he watches Michael K acting in the role, and he calls me over. and says, you know, Dave. I'm not gay. <laughs> it's, like, it's, okay. it's okay. Michael's good, but you know I'm just not gay. I'm like, it's okay, Don. It's okay. So on that weird note, I mean, but that's why that happened. It's, you now you see like, nothing's a plan. Nothing's a plan. Merci. Thank you, and thank you, and thank you. And thanks to the uh, to the center for having me. Um, it's really been it's been a lot. It's been a great three days. Merci. Et ça donne envie de voir ce voyeur. Right, thank you so very much. Thank you, David Dufresne, for being patient. And so by the time we change the scene, we continue with the lessons on images. Thank you very much. Enjoy the evening.